Good evening, and thank you very much for coming. I'm going to start off today with a, an illustrative story of the, the failure of the London Ambulance System back in 1992, because there are some useful lessons to draw out from that. And I want to, to move on then into real-world requirements, where, where they come from, uh, what goes wrong if, if you don't understand that most systems are socio-technical, that they've actually got people involved in the systems, and then to look at the relationship between computer systems and people's way of working and the way that that so often goes wrong as well. So, quickly tell the tale. Back in 1990, the London Ambulance Service was the largest ambulance service in the world. Uh, it, as you can see, transported a, a lot of people. It covered 600 square miles, transported more than 5,000 patients every day, had 2,700 staff. It's actually got a lot more now. It's, it's up to nearly 5,000. Uh, and a lot of vehicles. And the job of the central controllers was straightforward. It, it was what you would imagine in abstract terms, at the high level, it was straightforward. The detail of it was actually very complex, of course. You know, a call comes in, you need to find out where the emergency is. You need to eliminate duplicate calls, because otherwise you end up sending too many ambulances to the same place. Uh, you need to find the best ambulance to send, usually the one that's nearest. And that means that you need to know where the ambulances are and what, what the status of them is, whether they are, in fact, free and able to move. And then you contact that ambulance and you send it. And this was done manually. And it was done using a lot of, of voice calls and, and then uh, a computerised command and control system was put in uh, during the 1980s. And it ran into a lot of network congestion problems, and they abandoned that computerized system in 1990 and immediately planned for a more ambitious system that would follow it, because there was great enthusiasm for, for automating these processes. It was seen that the manual system really wasn't good enough, and, and everybody, it seems, to, to a first approximation, felt that a, a computer-based dispatch system would be better. So the computer-aided dispatch system was conceived. And that involved a, a computer map display, a gazetteer, so that you knew where the phone boxes were. Because, of course, most emergency calls were coming in from phone boxes. This was before the widespread adoption of mobile telephones. Automatic location of ambulances, part of the system, so that you knew where the ambulances were. You didn't have to phone the local ambulance station to find out where they were likely to be. The computer system would actually, from its information, select the appropriate ambulances to send uh, and present a, a selection of them for the, for the operator, the controller, to choose between. And the controller would select one, and then the details under this system would be sent by data link to the ambulance, which would go off to the call, acknowledge what its status is, tell the system when it arrived, when it left for the hospital, when it got to the hospital, when the ambulance was free again. So a lot of status updates, again, being done by data link in order to avoid the, the network congestion on the voice calls. This, this was very ambitious. They looked around at all the command and control systems that existed around the country and, and I think in some other countries and decided there was nothing available that would actually meet their requirements. So they decided that they had to have a bespoke system. But of course, the system has to be dependable. It, it must know where the vehicles are accurately and it must be trusted by the staff so that they're not trying to second guess the computer system because that could cause problems. So that's the setup. That's what they tried to do. They put out a call for expressions of interest. They got 35 companies responding. They demanded implementation by the 8th of January 1992. This is for a call for expressions of interest in 1991, that was an extraordinarily short time scale for what they were trying to do. They got full proposals from 17 suppliers. 
And the cheapest was, as you can see, from, from Apricot Systems Options and Data Track with their various responsibilities. Apricot was a hardware reseller, a subsidiary of uh, um, uh, Mitsubishi. And the, the bid was for just under a million, and it was 700,000. The cheapest bid was 700,000 pounds cheaper than the next most expensive bid. Systems Options estimated the software uh, at 35,000 pounds. <laughs> and, and in their bid, they said that they had experience of developing software for emergency services, which it's true, they had, but they'd never done a command and control system. They'd only done administrative software. The uh, London Ambulance people evaluating the bids um, didn't investigate this discrepancy. So the contract was awarded. Systems Options, somewhat reluctantly, became the lead contractor. They, they hadn't expected to win this bid, which is why they didn't put as much work into it as, as they might have done. Um, <laughs> But they, Apricot insisted that Systems Options were to be the lead contractor. And so they got on, they wrote the system design specification. Not surprisingly, the project slipped. Um, they had to interface with the existing communications hardware that, from the previous contract. The specifications were late being delivered. The software that Systems Options was writing turned out to take them longer than they'd forecast, of course. And so that caused things to slip. And they didn't get round to even trying to do any functional or load testing until January 1992, which was intended to be the, the full implementation date, of course. Uh, they ran into some problems, and in order to show that progress was being made, London Ambulance Service decided on a, a phased introduction of the new system. And... For the rest of 1992, or at least up until the 26th of October, they, they used the system that they'd got in a semi-manual fashion, whilst continuing to implement bits of it that weren't there to update things when, when there were problems. So they were taking calls on the computer-aided dispatch system. And they were using the computer map and, and gazetteer, but they were printing out the incident details in the control room and the best ambulance was being found then by the controller calling the appropriate ambulance station and handing over the details in that way. And then they went back to the computer-aided dispatch system for the mobilisation, so the data links were used. And they ran into various problems during 1992 while, while they were doing it this way. Um, the... The system didn't always know where the ambulances were. They had network black spots. The, the crews didn't necessarily notify their changes of status, either because they forgot or because they were in a communications black spot at the point where they needed to signal a change of status. Or it was even believed that perhaps they were deliberately misusing the system because they didn't trust it and didn't want it to be used. Uh, there were software errors. The, the 53rd vehicle, each, each 53rd vehicle wasn't, wasn't located. The, the software lost it. And the, the system couldn't cope with the way that the ambulance crews were used to working. They, would, they had preferred vehicles. They, 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 you know, some of the vehicles were more comfortable to drive or performed better or for various reasons. You know, maybe just because they, they had their sandwiches in that one, they decided that was the vehicle they wanted to take. And when it was a manual call and the decision as to which ambulance to use was left to the crews, that was fine. Once the system was saying which ambulance should be used, that created a problem because the system thought that something had gone wrong. So there were problems arising and the problems continued. The communication system ran into overloads as the, as the workload got higher. Uh, there were continuing hardware and software errors and so on. And what happened increasingly was that the system found itself losing knowledge of where the ambulances were. Despite that, the London Ambulance Service decided the thing to do was to put the system into service, into full service under the full automatic operation. 
uh, probably because at the back of their minds they felt that a lot of the problems were simply that the staff weren't trying hard enough, that they weren't committed, that they were deliberately causing problems, that if it was the way it was going to work, then they'd be able to work their way through the issues and sort out the system. So they reconfigured the control room, um, took the printers out, took away the, the ability to run the system manually, put in more screens, uh, moved people around in the control room. And they decided, and the system then, of course, identified the specific ambulance that was going to be taken. It found what the nearest ambulance, um, notified what route it should take, and that was transmitted to the ambulance. But of course, errors continued. They'd cut over, and errors continued. The crew continued taking the wrong vehicle or using the wrong call sign or taking a route that was different from the one that the system expected them to take, causing the system to tell the controllers back in, in central control that, that something had gone wrong, that an ambulance had gone off in the wrong direction. And gradually, the system lost track of the ambulances. And it generated exceptions. Uh, it allocated the wrong ambulance, ambulances that were, were too far away. Um, one of the consequences of, of always allocating the ambulance closest to the uh, incident was actually that some of the crews found themselves moving further and further and further and further and further away from their base um, ambulance station because they were continually called out to ever more remote incidents that were nevertheless close to them. And so they didn't like that, and perhaps for that reason started disabling the automatic location equipment. <laughs> the system generated a lot of exceptions. Multiple ambulances were sent to, to the same call. The exceptions scrolled up off the screens of the operators, and they lost the exception messages before they could actually intervene on the system and correct them. The delays built up. And as delays built up, uh, people who'd put in emergency calls, when the ambulance didn't arrive, phoned again. And so the call logs, the, the number of calls coming in built up as well. And the, the operators, the control staff, got completely overwhelmed. The delays got, got excessive. One ambulance turned up to find that the patient that they were supposed to be treating had actually been taken away by the undertaker. Some of the delays were, were up to 10 hours. Um, one, one person who'd, who'd uh, phoned in a call be because somebody had had a stroke, the, the stroke victim actually managed to walk to the nearest hospital before the ambulance arrived. There were claims that, that a number of patients died as a consequence of this. Um, the subsequent inquests don't actually bear that out. So in the afternoon of the second day, they decided that they'd go back to this semi-manual operation that had been working reasonably well. And they put extra staff into the control room in order to try to make it work. So they went, they went back to this system where they were, were using the, the uh, computer-aided dispatch system to take the calls, but they were printing out the, the details of, of the assignments and the allocation was being done by uh, the manual staff and, and then um, the dispatch was done again through the computer system. And that worked pretty well until the 4th of November, but obviously it wasn't going to be sustainable long term because they, they were using extra staff. This wasn't what they had introduced the system for. They wanted to get back to uh, using the automatic system. And on the 4th of November, at 2 o'clock in the morning, the system crashed. It gradually slowed down over a period of about 10 minutes, and then it crashed. Uh, they tried to reboot it. Uh, they had been told, the staff had been told, if this happens, reboot the workstations. They rebooted the workstations. It made no difference because the problem was a memory leak in the software of the server. And so the server had run out of memory. If they'd rebooted the server, that would probably have, have got them back up and running, although... You know, perhaps they would have lost some calls in the process. But the server was now down. The backup server couldn't be used because it was configured for the automatic system, not for the semi-manual system. It didn't know about the printers. Uh, it had never been tested, in fact, for either system because of the hurry that they'd, they'd been in. 
And so on the 4th of November, they went back to a fully manual system. That was, of course, a massive admission of failure, and the ch chief executive of the London Ambulance Service was forced to resign. A public inquiry was set up, and uh, a report is, is available, and in fact, uh, Anthony Finkelstein has, has uh, scanned it and made it available online. So if you, if you want to see the, the full details of that report, which gives a, a much richer picture than I've been able to, then, then that's where you'll find it. Some easy lessons. It was clearly overambitious and the timescales was unachievable. There's a general point that if you've got a, a procurement process that says we're going to take the lowest priced compliant bid, you almost always choose the, the bidder who least understands the problem. This is, this is not a good move because <laughs> it, e even if... You, you write the contracts in a way that means that a lot of risk falls on the supplier, which is, is what the National Programme for IT and the Health Service set about doing uh, a decade after this fiasco. Um, you, you can't outsource the business risk. Nobody's going to, to be able to solve the business problem that you're left with when your computer system crashes. So it isn't a winning strategy to, to try to get a a critical system built by somebody who doesn't understand what they're doing. The architecture that they'd got was, was too brittle. If the operators got overloaded, it was, it was going to be a catastrophe, and they were going to get overloaded if the system lost control of where the ambulances were. And there were lots of ways in which that could happen. So it was almost inevitable that the operators were going to get overloaded. And this is a, a well-known failure mode. The, the Three Mile Island nuclear accident is, is just one of many examples of computer systems that, that have not been able to do the job they were designed for because at the crucial point, too many messages were coming up to the operators for them to be able to respond to them in a sensible way. Another lesson from this is that it's a mistake to use a computer system to impose new work processes on staff who are either reluctant to work in the new way or who haven't been trained and accepted and learned how to, to do things in the new way really effectively. That, again, is a mistake that was made a decade later by the, the National Programme for IT and the NHS, the, the um, programme that ended up costing... 10 or more billion pounds, and, and um, a lot of which essentially got, got written off. And a lesson I would draw out is that the, f the frontline staff are often the people who best know what the practicalities are. Interestingly, the report, the, the inquiry report, drew out the point that the people factor is as important and arguably more important than the technical infrastructure. And I'll come back to that because it is a, a key lesson. Frontline staff are, are, are good at optimising the way they work. Sometimes they do it for the wrong reasons. They do it because it's, it's easy for them rather than because it makes the business operate more effectively. But gradually it becomes part of the culture. And some of the problems in, in the ambulance service computer-aided dispatch system were caused by staff resistance to, to work processes. And it's, if you're going to change the way people work, it's very important to understand how, how people work at the moment and, and to make sure that the new way of working is practical. The National Programme uh, for, for IT in the, in the NHS, uh, again, ran into these sort of issues. And there's, there's quite a lot more about, about the National Programme in the, in the lecture transcript than I've got time to talk about today, including a reference to a, a very long history of the issues that, uh, that came out, which, if you're really interested in this programme, you'll, you'll find fascinating. Uh, this was one particular dispute where the doctors who needed to access the electronic patient records were issued with smart cards to identify them so that the system could do role-based security and, and privacy control to make sure that the people who were looking at the patient records were authorised to do so. 
But the way it was implemented meant that if you had one doctor looking at the records and then another one needed to, the instructions were that the first one needed to log out and the second one needed to log in with their smart card. But of course, that took you back to a home screen and, and right back through the login process because you had to clear the screen for privacy reasons when the authorised person logged out. And then you had to navigate back through the, the tree of, of screens in order to get back to the patient records. So it took a long time. And the doctor said, you know, we work under too much pressure. This absolutely won't do. And they got, the BMA got into quite a standoff with, with the Department of Health over it. And, and they were disciplining or threatening to discipline doctors for, for not following the rules, even though they were impractical. So the lesson is that typically computer-based systems are both people and technology. And th there's a, an academic and increasing industrial view that we need to take a, a socio-technical view of computer-based systems. That requirements and statements about the real world, they're out in the real world. You know, what you care about is that, that um, airplane passengers get to their destination safely, not some detail about the way that the avionics on the aircraft works. The requirements are actually part of the bigger system. Computer systems are almost always there to support what people do, not the other way around. And the dependability of a system therefore depends on the people doing what the system expects them to do, as well as the system doing what the people expect it to do. There's a, there's a synergy here, and the system can go wrong in both ways. And behaviour of people is affected by a, a raft of things. Habits are, are obviously very important. People tend to revert to, to doing what they've done before in the way they've done it before. But training is, is hugely important. Um, I, I recall a, an aircraft accident, actually, where the, one of the, the causes of the accident was that the pilots reacted in exactly the way they had been trained to react, but the simulator turned out to have a subtle fault. It was subtly different from the real aircraft, and it led to the pilots doing the wrong thing. So even a, a simulator for, for training pilots can actually be safety critical. But e even on, on trivial systems, you think, training... Is, is important, and if you don't get it right, um, people behave in, in unexpected ways. This is a, uh, as I say, a trivial example, a true one, I'm told. A university provost's personal assistant. The, the IT support in the university noticed that the provost monthly newsletter was taking longer and longer to deliver. And, and then an email was sent round to all staff saying, please delete all emails from the provost. And it turned out that the PA, instead of um, starting typing in a clean template, had been routinely uh, opening the last letter that had been typed, deleting the contents, and starting typing in what was left. But since track changes was left on, <laughs> it meant that everybody who received anything from the provost got a complete audit trail of every letter that the provost had ever sent to anybody <laughs> about, you know, staff matters, salaries. Um, it's not known whether all the staff did, in fact, delete all the, the messages from the provost. One, one suspects perhaps not. And it's important to check how, how people behave. This, this is a... Uh, an example from, from a research project that was, was carried out in the Dependability in, Interdisciplinary Research Collaboration uh, a few years back. It was a, a mammography system where the, the way that the, the mammograms were, were being read was that a, an expert reader, a, a, you know, a professional um, scanner of, of the, and diagnostician would look at the mammograms and they would also have a computer 
assistant sitting next to them, a computer screen that was doing image analysis on the mammograms and prompting them to look at particular areas that the computer system felt might indicate uh, something that, that needed investigation. Because that computer system was merely advisory, it wasn't considered to be safety critical. And yet when the research came in, when, when the ethnographic study was done, it turned out that the effect of that system was that it made the poorer readers, the poorer professionals, better at their job by pointing out to them things that they might have missed. But it actually made the experts, the very best people, worse. And the underlying reason for that was that if the experts working on their own were unsure, they would recall the patient in order to examine them further. If they were unsure and the system didn't prompt them, then quite often they would say, that, that's all right, and wouldn't recall the patient for that reason. And so it actually weakened the ultimate, you know, the overall system capability. It, it weakened the number of, of um, actual cancers that, that were found by the screening process. And again, there's, there's papers that, that write this up and, and the references are in the transcript. Even experts get it wrong. Um, you've probably read about this in the, in the newspaper. This, this, this is a gem, I think. M Microsoft um, put a, a chat bot out. They, they've been doing some artificial intelligence uh, work and, and produced a, 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 a robot, a computer system, that, that they had programmed to, to behave like a, a young woman, a, a 18 to 24-year-old young woman, and to engage with people in, in um, discussions in chats over Twitter and, and in various other ways. If you go to, uh, to tay.ai, you can actually... Uh, uh, see what the current situation is. It's, I, I did this afternoon, actually. It's currently offline. <laughs> um, it, it, the the um, system, uh, it doesn't just interact. It, it has access to you know, a large set of, of um, tweets that have already been, been um, published out in, in the world. So it's got a, a big database of publicly available discussions that it can draw. And in order to try to behave like the, the target 18 to 24-year-old. Um, well, this is the way that the, uh, the Independent wrote it up. Took on the identity of a foul-mouthed genocidal Nazi. <laughs> uh, uh, within 24 hours of being introduced to the internet, it, it, it started off tweeting, hello world, and, uh, and got through to Bush did 9-11, Hitler would have done a better job than the monkey we've now, and Donald Trump's the only hope we've got. <laughs> Microsoft said, as it learns, some of its responses are inappropriate. <laughs> but it, it's a, a, a good example of not really understanding how the humans that are going to be part of this complex system are going to behave. Because, of course, the humans started playing it up. You know, they, they were trying to push it to see just how inappropriate they could, could get it to, to behave. And... And too often in developing computer systems, the focus is on the technology, not on the real requirement. Um, one, one of the mantras that we've been trying to put out around government is that there's no such thing as an IT project. Every significant thing that you think of as an IT project is really a business change project enabled by an IT system to support the new business processes but you've got to focus attention on the business processes, on the business change. And business processes cost a lot to change. Uh, from, from my experience, the, the business changes will take at least as long and cost at least as much as the new IT system. And they will require at least as much management attention and formal planning proper project plans for, for that process too. And the reason it takes so long is because you've got to trial the processes with enough people. You've got to go through a lot of iterations in order to make sure that the processes work. 
And while you're doing this, and while you're training people, first in the prototypes that you're trying out, and then in the real system before you can cut it over, you're going to need additional people to do the work of the people that you're now interacting with or training. So there are a lot of things that you need to do in order to bring about a business change, and it's expensive and slow. That gets overlooked. I've seen several major projects fail for exactly that reason, that people thought it was a technology project, and it wasn't. It was a business change project, and the technology was, was just servant to the business change. And the corollary of that is that if you decide that the way you're going to implement your new processes is to buy a package off the shelf, which most people want to do because it's seen as a lower cost thing to do than building a bespoke, a custom system, then what you're doing is buying business processes off the shelf. And very often, companies say, oh, um, we, we will be happy to adopt the business processes that, that this package incorporates. We understand, or at least this salesman tells us, they're state-of-the-art business processes, and therefore that's the way we will train our people to work. That will be fine. It's worked very well in, in this organisation, but there are reference customers for it. They found it very successful. It's bound to work well in ours, or, or we can make it work, or, or perhaps we can modify it. And there are two traps there. The, the first is the modification trap, because modifying somebody else's software, even if you're able to do it, is a very expensive, difficult, and error-prone thing to do. And you're going to need to do it every time the package is re-released. So every time there's a security update, you, you get to choose. Do you want the security update now, or do you want to wait until you've actually had the opportunity to invest all the time and effort in moving your changes into the new code base and, and then re-implementing it. Meanwhile, of course, you're exposed to the security risk because the vendor in bringing out a, a security patch has implicitly announced to the world what the security vulnerability is. There are lots of people out there who take, take updates apart, who run, run diffs on the on the binaries and find out what the changes are in order to be able to find what the security vulnerability is that's being fixed so that they can exploit it in companies where it hasn't been fixed. So you've got a problem. You've got a high cost in, in rolling forward if you're modifying a package, and you've got this uh, window of, of opportunity for cyber attack. And uh, quite often, suppliers will say, well, of course, you know, you." We're, we're very keen to, to incorporate anything that's really useful into our package. So, you know, tell us the things that, that you implement and, and we will consider incorporating them in our base package. Uh, well, yes, of course they will consider it, briefly, but, but they won't do it. Um, firstly, because that's probably not the way they want their package to evolve, and secondly, because they've got other customers who are making conflicting demands, and they can't satisfy everybody because the demands conflict. So that almost never happens. And changing, doing the other thing, changing how you work to fit in with the package may be impossible. Um, quite often in, in the National Health Service, we've attempted to bring in uh, US-based packages for, for healthcare, but the US system is very different to the NHS. The way in which it handles the work processes has a very heavy focus on billing, which isn't a major issue in, in the UK National Health Service. And in, in other areas, I, I, I worked on a, um, a litigation for a utility company that uh, had, had brought in a billing package for, for managing its customer data and, and processing bills for its customers for electricity. It was a, an Australian company. And the local Australian laws were very strict about the classes of vulnerable customers who you could not um, pursue rigorously if they hadn't paid their bills. And in particular, you couldn't cut them off. 
and there were various classes of different vulnerable people, and you had to, the, the system had to record all that in order to be able to process the bills effectively. You needed to know which vulnerable category, if, if any, your customer fitted into. But that made the customer records extremely sensitive because they were carrying information about people's uh, mental and physical conditions. And that meant that the data protection laws meant that many of the people who would normally have access to that system weren't allowed to have access to it. So the work processes just couldn't work with that, again, American package being brought into a different legal environment in Australia. And the same sort of things happened in UK universities. I mean, Oxford and Cambridge have both run into difficulties bringing in administrative packages that, that really did not recognise the complex structure of, of a, an Oxbridge University and its colleges. Uh, if you look on the web, you'll, you'll find some um, very amusing blogs about, um, about the troubles. So, my conclusions, well, the, the lessons I want to draw out of this are that, that requirements exist in the real world. They're, they're not about computer systems, they're about much bigger systems of which the computer system is just a component. And the people are also components in that system. And so if, if what you're trying to do is to design an optimal system to get a job done, you actually need to design the work processes and the people, that is to say, the way in which the people will actually carry out those work processes, and the IT support that you're going to provide to them, or, or other technology support as well that you're going to provide. And that means that you need to take responsibility for the training, for the training environments, for simulators, for making sure that the training works and that it's refreshed if the underlying business processes change in a subtle way, perhaps because of a, a package upgrade. So you have to take planning responsibility and management responsibility for the much larger system. It's not just about building an IT system. And when people try to do that, it almost always goes wrong. And that's one of the reasons why, as, as we've seen in previous lectures, the average um, computer software development um, project overruns by of the order of 100% in, in time and, and cost. One, one of the underlying reasons is, is that the, the wrong problem is being solved and it causes compromises that then cause delays which then, then cause, cost money. You can design business processes rigorously. Uh, the, the management consultants talk about business process re-engineering, uh, but that was just a Harvard Business School phrase by somebody who, who was a Harvard uh, professor but wasn't an engineer. And you can do engineering on business processes. Uh, if, you, if you look in the transcript, you'll find, find a reference to, to uh, a book on, on uh, business processes which um, shows a, um, a method that enables you to, to model the way that people work and the way that they interact and where the key interactions are and to see the effect of making changes to that. And it's a, it's a very powerful process. In fact, we, we've... In, in my previous um, company, we, we used it for, for modelling one complex system for somebody who, uh, who believed that they wanted an IT system. Uh, they, they were having real difficulty in, in um, scheduling the uh, audiovisual material that they had bought for a, a video channel. They, this was a cable television channel. And they, they needed to, to make sure that um, they, they were showing stuff at the right times in order that um, the, the license agreements that they had signed with the people who provided the content were used optimally, that, that they really did um, show the, the um, particular material as often as they were permitted to within the time scale that they'd bought it for, and that they scheduled it right so they didn't end up the week before Christmas only showing opera or, 
you know, the, the kind of um, nightmares that, that used to keep channel schedulers awake. And, and we modeled the, the entire processes um, for, for this person as part of the bid. And we took it down on a great big sheet of paper showing, showing the exact way that, that this all interacted and all worked. And after we, we talked the, uh, the customer through it, uh, he said, thank you, that's just what I need. And he took and put it up on the wall and said, I don't need an IT system now. I understand what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> we, we managed to get him to pay for the bid, but um, it, it wasn't the outcome we, we had been hoping for. <laughs> and, and finally, the, the point that the people who are carrying out processes do need to be involved in designing the new ones. And if you don't do that, it, it creates a feeling of distrust and disrespect, as well as losing access to the real expertise in the practicalities of the job being done. Uh, so the notion that you can impose business change on people by giving them a, an IT system that, that sort of rolls out idealised um, processes is, is really dangerous. It's another mistake that the National Programme for IT and the Health Service tried, um, made, made when, when they, were, they were trying to, um, to get all the hospitals in the UK to follow what was considered to be best practice. But it didn't take account of local variations. So, for example, one example that, that I was told about was the, the process that was uh, incorporated in the software for discharging a patient, and which had to be followed step by step, had as its penultimate step get the medication that you're going to send home with the patient from the pharmacy. And the, the IT system wouldn't give you the capability of doing that earlier. That was the point at which you had to do it. But in quite a lot of hospitals, the rural hospitals in, in the UK, the pharmacy's not open at the weekends. And that meant that they were in a position where if they followed the process and didn't try to subvert and circumvent the system, they couldn't discharge patients at the weekends. You know, this is just taking too idealised a view of a process and not recognising the, the local impacts. And in fact, the, uh, the Connecting for Health team finally woke up to the fact that the, the national scheme was really not the ideal way to do it, and, and they introduced the uh, national, the, the, the NHS local ownership program, it was called, the N NLOP, uh, which devolved responsibility for what systems were being introduced to the, the local acute trusts. Um, the cynics said that NLOP stood for no longer our problem. <laughs> so thank you very much.